geographic at all. I think it's a failure of imagination to suppose that most communities in a stateless society have to be geographic. I think they often need to be, ought to be deterritorialized. For instance, something like the ancient uh, law merchant might be expected to govern certain kinds of economic transactions. People interested in taking advantage of a consistent set of rules for such transactions might belong to virtual communities, linked by the internet and built on interlocking networks of trust that connected them with each other as they moved and worked into diverse geographic regions. These voluntary virtual communities could provide a range of services to their members, dispute resolution, for instance, grounded in principles widely shared among their members. Membership in such communities might make it a lot easier, in fact, for people to establish trust-based relationships with those who would otherwise be strangers. And members who exploited other members' trust obviously would soon find themselves without the benefit of membership. You don't need geography for that. People of all sorts who are willing to live peacefully, to allow members of their own communities opportunities for exit and voice, can contribute creatively to the ongoing process of experimentation and discovery that will enable a stateless society to flourish. Not all communities are going to work well. Right? I think that's just a given. Some, indeed, may be dysfunctional and even destructive. And many will doubtless be committed to visions of the good life that are quite different from mine. That's OK. Who's going to decide what life looks like under anarchy? We will. All of us, through the innumerable individual decisions we make in communities and workplaces, associations and spontaneous gatherings, whether they're geographic or not. What will the plan, the system, the dominant norms look like? There won't be a plan. There won't be a system. There won't be dominant norms. There will just be the diverse plans and systems and norms created and maintained by genuinely free people in a dizzying variety of environments and following an unbelievable wealth of patterns. Now, as I've said, I've got fairly strong convictions about how I'd like to see things work without the state. Some of my convictions are moral. I think some things would be unjust and exploitative and subordinative and exclusive. Some of them are practical. I think authoritarian bureaucracies, for instance, just aren't very good at managing the production and distribution of goods and services. Now, I wouldn't hold these convictions if I didn't think they were plausible, if I didn't think they made sense, if I didn't think they were consistent with experience, but I recognize that I might be dead wrong about any number of my specific convictions. Indeed, that's one reason I find anarchism so appealing. Without a little cognitive humility, it's easy to assume that I've got a model, I've got a plan that's just right for everybody, and all I need is the right sort of benevolent philosopher queen to implement it. But of course, it's that kind of naive idealism about the capacities of states and the motivations of authority figures that's gotten us into the mess we're in now. The mess in which the state exercises enormous power and dominates our lives. If you think the experts can get it right, then you've delivered us into the hands of the state. Accepting that some kind of cognitive humility makes sense that I might well be dead wrong is a crucial reason not to support some kind of cookie cutter standard to be imposed across the board on communities in a stateless society. Anarchy will give people the freedom to experiment, to figure out what works, to test ideas and ideologies, and figure out what happens when they're actually put into practice. Now, here's what we have to expect. Some options are going to work well. People will improve on them and refine them, and others who observe them in practice will emulate them and they'll spread. Others, on the other hand, we know this in advance, some are going to be disastrous. People are going to abandon them with relief. And others will likely prove stable enough that people who are attached to them will preserve them and try to muddle through. The point is that only by trying things out are we going to figure out just how much merit options really have. One side note here that I think is pretty important, an advantage of this kind of experimentation ought to be pretty obvious. If it goes badly wrong, it goes badly wrong in a way that affects a much more limited number of people than if the state does something that goes badly wrong.
When the state screws up, the results are catastrophic. When people in a voluntary community screw up, things are bad, but they don't put the world at risk in the same way. A large-scale state can do far more harm than a virtual or geographic voluntary community. Now, that doesn't mean that all options are equally okay. This is not moral relativism or moral nihilism. I'm not arguing that because there are going to be different possibilities on display, all of them are equally good. I'm not saying that we somehow can't make good judgments about what's right and wrong, good and bad. I'm not saying let's just throw that out the window. Being an anarchist doesn't commit you to being a relativist or a nihilist. But there are all sorts of ways of being flourishingly human. Viable human life doesn't require we all follow the same cultural patterns endorse the same mores, inculcate the same folkways in the next generation. Now, for instance, some people thrive in bustling, open, cosmopolitan environments. Other people, I pretty clearly, prefer the stability and familiarity of relatively self-contained communities. As long as nobody in a given community is coerced into conforming, enslaved, prevented from leaving, as long as everyone is treated decently, then there's no good reason for anybody else to object to the existence or operation of a given community. Individuals and networks in a stateless society can and should help those who are trying to escape slavery, free abuse, or overthrow tyranny. I think individuals can and should challenge cultural patterns, communal institutions that oppress and exclude, but that's not an argument for having anarchist busybodies spend their time trying to remake other people's communities, make them look like their own. And practically, of course, people are just going to lack the time and the energy and resources to engage in interventionistic, manipulative campaigns at the drop of a hat. This costs money. Under the state, you shift those costs to all sorts of other people. But if you have to bear the cost of being a busybody yourself, there's a considerable disincentive to being one. We can also hope, of course, for mutual tolerance among members of different voluntary communities and networks, at least sometimes within limits, right? I mean, the state depends on the widespread acceptance, bizarre, unfortunate, of the legitimacy of its authority. Similarly, a stateless society is going to function best when people internalize norms that allow different groups, different voluntary, peaceful, cooperating groups to coexist. Now, obviously, it may not always be efficient or required for people to actively intervene in unjust situations, but real injustice can never be treated as trivial. Again, I'm not saying ignore the injustice, but the reality is it's very easy to start treating other people's peaceful voluntary communities as if they were uh, sources of uh, sin and evil that ought to be wiped off the earth. We see states do this all the time, and there's clearly good reason for a stateless society to feature an ethic that makes that kind of violent, apocalyptic response uh, not viable. Respect for other people's freedom and dignity certainly ought to create a presumption, even if not an indefeasible one, against attempting to reshape their ways of life. The experimentation that happens in a stateless society can't happen if you and I are constantly trying to tell other people how voluntarily to live. I mean, in the widespread benefits, of leaving different groups of people free to explore different voluntary strategies for living well will give everybody a reason to let the process of discovery within multiple communities continue. As a general rule, the reality is, I think we've all observed this, people learn most effectively not by being lectured at, but by seeing and experiencing for themselves. If I participate in the life of a particular community, I will benefit, certainly, from the ongoing discovery in that community of what works and what doesn't. But I also recognize that the success of my community will make it easier to share with other people ideals that matter to me, to put them on display. Seeing those ideals put into practice, other people will be more likely to acknowledge their value and to respect my community and the way it works. In turn, this also means that communities which peacefully, voluntarily, explore ideas that are dramatically different from mine, even diametrically opposed to mine, actually in some important ways do me a favor, do other people a favor. If they work, they challenge me to discover new human possibilities, possibilities I might have been inclined to ignore. 
and they help me to remember that I'm not at the